want to uh, tell you what we've already done and then what we're going to do tonight. So um, there is a video of our artist talk from the first show, and in that we talked about um, the art and the history of the bridge, and so that's available online. There's an iPad up there with the video on it. So um, we're not going to talk so much about the art tonight as um, art as method, meaning how did creating these works change our artwork, our thinking, and for me as a transportation planner and a climate change planner, is there any relationship to be to create between creating art and thinking through problems that urban planners deal with? Um, uh, DJ is a writer and a historian and, a si and worked in city management before, so we all have a second thing we do, and Roderick uh, is in, involved in art education with high school students, so we're asking this question, is art not just about the product, but does the process produce any change? Um, uh, so um, how this got started is uh, I have a plein air painting group. We were painting from the 7th Street Bridge, kind of like the bridges. I got this idea of studying them. I asked Rod, who lives in my community and is a friend and an artist, and then we thought it does doesn't have to be a painting, so I invited DJ to join us and write an essay, and his essay is in these binders, it's available online, um, and he's going to read a little bit from it today. Um, so I would like to just get right into it. We have four questions we're going to discuss uh, briefly with you. So the first question is, has the experience of creating, uh, the experience of the 4th Street Bridge slash viaduct affected your work in the pieces themselves um, and in urban planning, writing, visual art making, whatever else you do. I just realized before we answer that, I'd like to ask Don to read a passage sure. to get us warmed up. So this is um, a, sec a brief section from the very end of the, of the essay. Um, and the essay is called A Traveler Comes to a Bridge. And this very last section begins, the 4th Street Viaduct bears desires across railroad tracks, across access roads, across the blank surface of the Los Angeles River Channel, and across time. Some are desires you may not recognize today or want anymore. But the viaduct cannot do otherwise, or be other than what it is. So well made was it, with skill and an eye toward the effect of its repeating elements of arch and trefoil pylon and spire, light and shadow. These elements which framed the city's aspirations in 1931 are still available today as a borrowed elegy for a city full of, still full of anxieties about its place. The contained river below and the stylish viaduct above were intended to be monuments of Anglo triumph over nature and space. Achievements that need thoughtful translation if we are to bridge the abyss made by the city's subsequent erasures of memory. Recovery of the commonplace is sensuous. The sight, smell, sound, and touch of things that might be the prelude to an embrace or a blow, that might make us cringe at their maker's motivations, that might require humility, even love, instead of fury or contempt when considering the history of these things. Crossing over a bridge is risky. A traveler comes to this bridge, articulate framework suspended between its past and our future, to cross over its consort river that divides Boyle Heights from the Arts District. The number of pedestrians is fewer now, and the passengers waiting for the streetcar, streetcars are gone. A Metrolink train rumbles under one of the viaduct's arches, a tree rooted within or under the roadway deck tops the parapet where it crosses Santa Fe Avenue. A homeless man is living on the Belvedere that projects from the arch of the first pylon as, as the bridge prepares to leap east. A shopping cart and plastic sheeting make a barrier in front. The sidewalk here is only five feet wide and the footing is uneasy because the metal grates that provide access to conduits under the sidewalk are uneven. Pearly grit, enough to support a few shoots of grass has gathered along the parapet edge as if a slow-moving river had, had passed over the bridge, dropping silt. The Belvedere beneath the arch 
of the opposite pylon stinks of urine. The streetlight lanterns here are missing glass panels, so only the skeletal arch remains in the metal frame. Time and the vandalism of indifference work on the 4th Street Viaduct every day, part of the pathos of the things in our lives. Yet insulators for the streetcar wires on the light standards next to the pylon and the catenary holdfast over the arch remain as the viaduct's memories of itself not yet erased. The banister under the traveler's hand has the feel of stucco. The thread of water in the low flow slot below glints and murmurs. The advent of something terrible or beautiful seems to be near. Some birds wheel overhead. In 1998, the 4th Street Bridge was retrofitted to improve the lateral stability of its arches in an earthquake. In 2014, the National Bridge Inventory of the Federal Highway Administration determined that the entire 4th Street Viaduct met, met the, quote, minimum tolerable limits to be left in place as is, unquote. Although the geometry of the roadway deck is, quote, basically intolerable, unquote. The report added that the viaduct is, quote, functionally obsolete. Thanks. Thank you, Rod. So before we start, why don't Rod, you introduce yourself and your first impression of the bridge. Well, my name is Roderick Smith, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm sitting here looking at one of the drawings that I did and, you know, trying to recall the uh, process of making that bridge, but I, I do remember that painting and the other painting on the other side when I started that, as I located that bridge and I marked it on a big white piece of paper. And I said, well, there's the bridge, okay? And uh, how am I gonna get to the bridge? So through a series of drawings and drawings and drawings, drawing closer and closer to the bridge, I became familiar with the bridge. So my story is really about drawing and using drawing as an access tool to just about anything. Not just to depict the bridge, but to experience it. So I'm an advocate of drawing as a, as a means to or in, in your imagination or in the place that you're at. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a meditation. So these drawings here are sketches of the bridge, but the bridge is also immersed in, in something far more complex than just the bridge itself. So that's what these paintings are about. Thank you. And just to that comment on, on Rod and, and Don. Um, we ask you to sketch, right, in the urban planning curriculum, and it's not that you will be become artists, but the point that Rod makes is that sketching and drawing is a form of encountering a thing and learning about it. And from DJ's beautiful reading, you can see that writing about things is also an artistic form in which people discover meaning and in, with which we communicate meaning. So part of my goal in inviting or compelling you guys to come <laughs> is that uh, we begin as urban planners to think broadly about the ways we get information, certainly census data is important, but how we understand meaning. And this is where I think art, the work of artists, and you working whatever method you like um, are important to urban planning. So I think what I'd like to do is I realize the first of the four questions is the most boring one. <laughs> so let's only do that if we have time. The second question is, the show takes a phenomenological approach. Um, phenomenology comes from the Greek word which means that which appears and study. And phenomenology favors description over prescription. And this show says it has no manifesto, no hypothesis, no message other than three people exploring the same phenomenon, this one bridge, and reflecting on their experiences. So um, acknowledging this, the question for our panel is, does this type of art have relevance for prescription, for arguing for change in an area such as urban planning or climate change policy, historical analysis, art education, working with youth or design, 
Are they two different worlds, or what is your view of the relationship between phenomenological work, which is about really knowing things and describing them, and then as urban planners, we're involved in making recommendations to solve problems. Is there a connection between those two things? And you don't have to answer for urban planning, but whatever, wherever your muse takes you. Well, um, uh, uh, most immediately, um, my work as a, a, as, as a historian is about particularities, about how particular places and things and aspects of the built environment are. And I'm concerned about their histories, but I'm also concerned about their current presence in our lives. And I think there is something important in that attentiveness that might be useful to an urban planner. Certainly, it's a part of the part of the repertoire of, of an artist. Uh, close, uh, patient attention to something leads to um, many different kinds of, of revelation, a revelation of, of, of the thing itself, also a, a re an internal revelation. The, the, uh, the, uh, the thing studied manifests itself in the observer. The point I'm trying to make, of course, is that un unless you um, can uh, take in the, the whole of a thing, like the bridge, its present state, its historical uh, realities, as you take it all in, you really can't make too many uh, wise decisions about what should happen next in its history. So close attention to partic particularities is the phenomenological approach to acquiring an internal transformation that might lead to um, a, uh, a, a new use of or transform, transformative reuse of uh, a thing like a bridge. Well, for me, it's, it's, it's an experiential thing. Um, I didn't even really know where the 4th Street Bridge was, really. I kind of like a lot of people, it's the 1st Street Bridge, are you, so the 4th Street Bridge, or oh, the 6th Street's coming down. There's kind of a confusion about this. Years ago, I taught a class, a um, high school class, and the LA River was the theme, and I had them do a collage, eight-foot collage, of a, a, a series of drawings of LA, 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 LA. By the time they were done, the entire collage was filled. There was no sign of the LA River. So we entitled it, Can You Find the LA River? Um, so uh, this experience of, of being involved with the Fourth Street Bridge was a way of finding my compass on the LA River. And it's just one landmark. It makes me realize there are, this, this city is, 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 is full of landmarks. I spent 25 years living in Portland, Oregon, moved down to Los Angeles about 10 years ago, and people up there say, what is it you like about Los Angeles? What is it about LA that's so cool? And I thought to myself, and I tell them, that it's, it seems to be a work in progress all the time. It's not the, the, it's not the set piece like Portland, Oregon is. It's a, it's a work in progress. It's a discovery every time you go out into it. Um, even where we live in Highland Park, it's like changing rapidly from month to month. Everything is changing. And so going to the bridge just piqued my, my realization that Los Angeles is full of forms. It's full of icons. It's full of history. Things are buried within things. The essay that uh, Don wrote is really amazing, walking through time and feeling that bridge change through time and realizing that we're in our little bit of time and the bridge is almost completely ignored. The bridge to the south side of it or to the west side has come down and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of coming to an awareness of your city through, through an icon. And that for me has been very rewarding, doing all the drawings and sketches leading me to that. And so for me, my emphasis in teaching urban planning is not is that there is not a one-size-fits-all answer to planning problems, that there isn't even one proper process for doing planning. And my message for those of you who've taken planning theory with me is fit the planning process to the context. Now that's not a context of a physical object, but it's the same intention to study carefully context, to be attentive rather than an urban planner operating on autopilot. This is how we did the last study. This is how we deal with historic bridges. This is the economic value of them. Here's the traffic flow. That's attentive to some aspects, but we need to be attentive to everything. So 
I haven't been thinking about this term phenomenological very much, but I realize it's an instinct I have toward that. And I think for me it leads to humility that I thought I knew everything about this bridge. I'm a transportation planner, I can look up the average daily travel and all that stuff. But having this experience, I realize I don't know anything about this bridge and I know a little more by studying it over a year. So humility and also care. I care about it much more now than I did before. Um, and what I want to do as an urban planner is induce an attitude of care among the broader population. Care for things, care for one another, and care for the environment in relationship to this class. Now, climate change phenomenon is scientific and not a thing you could study like we studied this bridge, but I think bringing the same attitude of care and humility to science is also uh, appropriate. Um, and so in a way, my doing this is my declaration of war against nihilism, the meaningless of things. This is the opposite of saying that things are meaningless. Um, and the excesses of postmodernism, which look at everything from multiple perspectives and um, tend to lead to a nihilist attitude sometimes. So doing the work is a declaration of faith for me in my work, the bridge, our city, our society. Okay, um, any question or pushback on anything we've said? Okay, we'll do another one then. Uh, and this one Don came up with. Uh, narrative was once a historiography until narrative became suspect, suspect in both. What if any, any are the narrative qualities of your work? But this one, let's start with Rod. What are the narrative qualities of your work? Well, you know, uh, drawing and art is a real personal thing. Um, narrative is built in process of creating things. Um, right now I'm working on another drawing about this big at home. The narrative that I'm using is old cave drawings, cave paintings, and they're collaging them one on top of the other in the same style. The narrative is a sort of a journey into the unknown. That's what this is. The unknown was the bridge. And then unknown was all the drawings that came from. And then unknown was, was, was trying to find out where the bridge was in the city. And um, so for me, art is, uh, is a, it's a personal narrative of search and discovery. It's all journey to the unknown. And, uh, and uh, you start with an unknown entity. In this case, my, I too knew nothing about the 4th Street Bridge. I couldn't even find it. But um, the journey is discovery. And the journey is, is also discovering creative impulse and how you relate to that, and how you interpret something, and how you go about doing something you've never done before, rather than following down the same path. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the journey, but being really willing to rely upon intuition and the knowledge that you gain from, from study, from, from dozens and dozens of drawings of this bridge, and going down there and being around this thing, and uh, seeing it, and, and, and seeing it in different lighting, and so forth. That's a, it's a narrative that's driven from within the process itself. And uh, uh, so I'm very much about uh, drawing as a, as a means of, of discovery uh, uh, in, into the unknown and a kind of process of rebirth. Um, the author Joan Didion is famous for saying that we tell, we tell stories in order to live. Um, I, I take that in a slightly different direction. I think that I tell stories in order that the things I write about should come to life. Uh, the 4th Street, Street Bridge uh, is easily disregarded. It, it is like so much of our lives, like so much of Los Angeles, easily disregarded. We are, uh, our eyes pass over it, and we move on to whatever, wherever we're going. But if we know the story of something, if we know the story of the 4th Street Viaduct, suddenly it comes alive for us. And for example, let me tell you a story about this, this bridge. There are six monumental bridges built between the late 1920s into the early 1940s across the Los Angeles River from what is now kind of downtown in the Arts District to uh, High, uh, 
um, Lincoln, Lincoln Heights and Boyle Heights. All of those bridges but this one are built in the monumental style of ancient Rome or, or a Beaux-Arts Paris or, or a Renaissance Spain. They, they look like bridges designed for the uh, entrance of, a, of, a, of, a, of an emperor into the city. This bridge isn't. This bridge is designed in a kind of modified English Gothic style. It's like the kind of design you would see in a late medieval uh, English cathedral. It's a churchy architecture, not triumphant in that sense. So why is this bridge different from all the others? Well, it turns out, of course, that this bridge goes from downtown, the west side, crosses the river, and goes, takes its travelers to Evergreen Cemetery, and later, other cemeteries, the Catholic Cemetery, the Chinese Cemetery, the Serbian Cemetery, two Jewish cemeteries. It's the bridge that takes mourners from the city to a place of burial. And so it was thought appropriate that the bridge should be done in this somewhat solemn uh, medieval ar cathedral architecture. So when you cross this bridge, you, are, you were expected to have a moment of solemn re re reflection uh, as the cortege of uh, mourners passed across the bridge. There was even a, a a trolley uh, uh, line that went down the bridge, across the bridge to Evergreen Cemetery, and there was a special trolley that that could carry a coffin and the mourners. So you had a sort of electric, an electric hearse that went across the bridge. And if you know those kinds of stories, suddenly a thing that could be easily disregarded blossoms, opens out, becomes different. And that's why I tell stories, to, to bring things alive that might otherwise be rendered mute and dead. Great. I just, I'm going to tell a story about Don that uh, just occurred to me. And that has to do with attentiveness. It's back to the first theme. But I didn't notice that what was at the top of the light standards was still the insulators for the wires that suspended the wires for the trolley that went across the bridge. Don noticed that. He also noticed that the, the, um, uh, the light standards don't match each other. They leapfrog side to side. So he noticed the dust on the top of the bridge and it, that it was like silt. So these are qualities I want to have of really noticing detail and helping give an understanding of history or making the connection with the, with the cemetery. So. Uh, in terms of narrative, the question I thought of as, at first I thought of as an urban planner. So the first version of narrative in urban planning was the modernist movement, post-war construction of suburbs and freeway-oriented transportation systems, an idea of a single public interest, and planning proceeded along those ideas, and as we talked about in class today, the rational comprehensive planning process sort of relates to that. So the 1960s brought a challenge to this idea that there's only one narrative, right? The women's movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the, the environmental movement, all challenged that master narrative of progress, of modernism. Um, so planning changed to recognize multiple narratives, right? That uh, Leonie Sandercock is a planning theorist. She was our Dale Prize winner many years ago. She wrote a book called The Power of Story in Planning. Mm -hmm. So when we do community engagement now, we just don't do a single survey, say, check box A or B. We ask for people's stories and their narratives to understand their community better. So with all that said, with regard to my work, I realized I had no narrative agenda at all. Um, if there is a narrative in the paintings, it expresses itself subconsciously. So. I think a little like Rod said, my approach is just reverence and longing to be able to appreciate beauty and to capture it and express it, um, and to concentrate on the subject. So 
I don't have a narrative agenda in painting other than appreciation for what is. I might, might add that though I regard narrative as a, a critical capacity for understanding, uh, I'm not unaware of the power of narrative to uh, replace other people's memories. I try to be prismatic in my work, coming at something like the bridge from multiple perspectives. And I break down the narrative so that it's not one continuous uh, triumphant, triumphal passage from, from, the, from the past to the present. I, I, I stall the process and, 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 and linger, and quite literally linger on the bridge, because I, I don't think of narrative as uh, the, a tool for enforcing my vision on you. I think of narrative as a mechanism by which I can break <coughs> down uh, a, a significant thing like the bridge and begin to pull out of its parts uh, a, a, way of, a way of being sensitive to what the bridge actually is. For me, it's not the answer to questions. It is a collection of more questions. You know, um, looking at this drawing right here, uh, the narrative, I'm recalling the narrative, and the narrative was basically, this was done from Lincoln Heights. I went up there, did a series of sketches, and I took photographs looking down at the city, looking to the west. There on the right is the metropolis, Los Angeles, which is in a state of constant building, a constant change, a, a, an old LA tr becoming a modern LA. And then somewhere in there is lost the river, and in the distance is the Fourth Street Bridge, like a ghost, you know, the, the, the lead character of the narrative in the far distance. But over on the left is, is the General Hospital. And that thing is a monument. It's like, a, it's like an outcropping of granite or something. It's, uh, it, evidently, it's so thick and well made that they can't even, if they wanted to, knock it down. It is a solid mass. But there it is opposite the city. It's like the bridge that was taking mourners to the distant cemeteries. It, it's, it was built on the other side to service the people of Los Angeles and then also stand upright and say, everything's going to be all right. We've built a hospital for you. Um, it's, it's outside the gates of Rome, but it's, it's, it services the people of Rome. And so when I was doing that drawing, which is a very vigorous drawing and done very, not, I wouldn't say quickly, but done in a... <laughs> And, and also, it's kind of like, you know, I'm at a stage in my life with art that I don't, I don't really want to know what I'm doing. I don't want to have a preconceived uh, idea of it anymore. I want art to be able to take me where I've never been. I want it to be an adventure, and it is. All you have to do is be willing to let yourself go and try different materials. So from that personal standpoint of what art is and how this 4th Street Bridge project opened up and the wonderful opportunity to kind of tell this story in triad, uh, to be a part of that is, is a thrill and because it's opened up m new doors and many new doors and that, I think drawing is a very uh, wonderful thing and you know I think in urban planning that the, the, the being opening learning how to do sketches and being comfortable with that allows you to go places and experience things on site uh, like Rick said you can sit there and you can meditate for 30 minutes and get more out of a place than you could ever just walking by even just taking pictures the process lands you it's like a time machine the liturgy of drawing and on-site work like this allows you to be present for periods of time. And that's really essential because there's a tendency for all of us to constantly be moving. I know this from 12 years of plein air painting up in Oregon. When I used to go out and paint in the wilderness and I would go down to the coast and I would paint, I would be there for hours and hours and hours and I could feel people coming and going all around me. They would come down to the river, come down to the beach, come down there, throw a stone, pick something up, go back, drive away, come and go. I felt this motion of, of humanity, even in the wilderness, while I just stood there for hours and hours and hours gazing out and trying to capture things with paint. So it's, it's a way of stepping out of the, of the relentless movement of time. That's what drawing and painting allows you to do. And I think it's important, and I think it's, it's available to anybody who's interested in, in doing that very thing. I'm... An awful lot of my work as a, as a writer began many, many years ago uh, in graduate school at uh, UC Irvine when I was told to read a book by uh, the French phenomenologist Gaston Bachelard, a book called The Poetics of Space. And, and Bachelard um, 
finds the lyric poetry in the most ordinary, mundane, everyday things. And I, I've not been able to do exactly that kind of writing, but I wanted to do that. And so the opportunity to, that uh, Rick and, and Rod gave me was to embed a, a, a mini phenomenological essay within the longer essay about, about, the, um, about, the, about the bridge. But, my, but it did not change my overriding purpose as a writer dealing with Los Angeles, which is my overriding purpose, my argument, if you will, is that we need to look hard at this place and understand it as much as we can, because if we don't look hard and understand it, this place as much as we can, we make horrifically poor decisions about it. I believe that paying attention has a political quality that we make very bad public policy choices about our, our, the place where we live because we don't spend enough time understanding it and being with it and looking at it hard and, in, and being engaged with it. So that, that aspect of my work as a writer has not changed. That's what I always have done. And as an urban planner and particularly as a transportation planner, um, I would say this experience has softened me. It softened my, my, my willingness to rely on analytical evidence, and it's slowed my rush to judge about things. So, for example, at the end of Don's essay, somebody declared the bridge functionally obsolete. There's an issue with the geometry of it. It rises and turns at the same time, so the the sight lines are not what engineering standards would like because you can't see what's coming ahead. To me, that painting there shows it. It gives this great drama when you're going from uh, east to west. So I love it. And yeah, there's a kink in it. So uh, transportation planners in the city of Los Angeles and Caltrans and other agencies might reach a decision someday that this bridge is functionally obsolete and must be replaced. The Sixth Street Bridge had a particular problem with its concrete, that's why it was torn down and being replaced. But if a proposal was put forward to replace it, what changed me about doing this work is I realized the multifaceted set of things and meanings people would feel about that. Some may say, I don't care, let's did a, get a faster bridge, a wider bridge, and some might be crushed because of a experience they've had in it. Um, I did a show once on paintings of freeways and people gave me all sorts of feedback like not enough cars on the freeway, you're being dishonest, it's worse than that, yeah. to I get to that point and I know I'm almost home and I have this great feeling, I love that image. So as a transportation planner, you know, we are a bit slow compared to other fields of planning into being wise about the qualitative dimension, the meaning of things, but certainly this experience reinforced that to me. Um, so, we'd be very disappointed if you didn't have a comment or a question, so please, yes. I had a comment about the writing, that as you, as you read what you had written, uh, it, it was a really great narrative, I almost felt like I was watching a KCET documentary, like looking at all the images of the bridge, bridges and the light posts, and it really goes hand in hand and really further romanticizes the bridge itself, so I compliment the writing very well. Thank you very much. It's great, very kind. Yeah, Alvin. Um, I have a, a question for uh, Roderick. So this project you mentioned was like one of the first times you've ever used this the fresh paper, mm -hmm. and it was, it was an idea brought to you by by Richard. Does this somehow influence you for future work that you're going to you know pay attention to more of the subtle things, or was this kind of on the trajectory that you were already working? Towards? I, I've been on. I've been on. Uh, I've been. Uh, I've been doing a lot of drawing for the last couple of years, uh, but I've never really found a place for it, because I keep thinking that somehow drawing is going to lead lead me back to painting, or that drawing is going to open up a kind of world of abstract. I've always been kind of on the cuspy edge between expressionism and re and realism, and uh, and abstraction is a is 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 an emotional response that I have, but I always. I always put my hat on a on a, on a narrative object, a symbol, a, 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 something there that, that that is known. 
Um, so working it big like this and Rick telling me, oh, Rod, you're going to have a couple big walls. Okay. So I thought to myself, well, how can I, how can I take drawing onto, the, onto a bigger scale? Um, so really it's a continuation of the love of drawing that started years ago that is somehow in my mind a, 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 a process that I'm trying to understand as it compares to painting. Painting is different than drawing. And it's a hard thing to define, and any definition that I, I have or that I've read or that I hear is somehow inadequate for my, for my understanding because it's a piece of that idea. But drawing is a means to, to, to discover. And I'm, I keep thinking that somehow I'll draw myself into a world that will lead me back into painting, and that painting will be completely different than it was before. Mm -hmm. So that's what motivates me. It's this idea of, of, of just movement, this idea of movement. And I, that's where I am with art now, after many, many years. And uh, so this has opened up a whole, this is a whole, a whole, it's opened up a whole new studio in my house because I've been able to adjust myself to this. And it's very exciting because I, it's also on paper and because it's not stretched canvas, there's a kind of informality about it that is, that is central to journaling and to write and to drawing on paper that's different than when you stretch a piece of canvas. It doesn't have that monumentality. Also, because I'm working in the middle and working out, I don't feel like I'm contained by the rectangle shape of a canvas, which bothers me. And that's one reason why I'm inspired by the, you know, the, the caves of India and the, and, the, and, the, and the prehistoric caves of France and Spain, is that they seem to be unlimited in their framing. They seem to roll across the top of the ceiling. So working on a large piece of paper, working in the middle, just stretching, stretching, moving, moving, moving out. Also, I feel like unlimited space. So those are the things that I'm working with. Or no last question. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much for coming, and thank you to Rod and DJ for this panel. Thanks a lot.